Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And today I'm continuing my conversations with Brother Jason Jack. And we're doing a series titled 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. And uh, uh, 101 verses, I think we're on number 59 on our list today. So we've already covered a lot of ground. And I hope you will go back and watch this whole series from the beginning. Uh, all the prior videos are uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So now we're going to pick up where we left off. And we happen to be talking about one of the most used verses in the Bible, the most famous uh, and well-known and used verses uh, to teach the, uh, the, the gospel that salvation is a free gift. So let's start with this. Brother Jason Jack, you want to say hi or anything before we get started? Hey, just ready to do another video. Okay then. So the verse is Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. All right, brother, you get the privilege. Well, this is the Philippian jailer, and Paul and Silas were in a prison in Philippi, and they were singing praises unto God. The Philippian jailer um, was hearing these songs that they were singing. Uh, who knows? He might have been seeking God prior to that. He might have um, heard some of the teachings of Jesus. And at midnight, there was a great earthquake, and the prisoners were free because of this earthquake. And the Philippian jailer looked around and knew what would happen if the prisoners escaped on his watch. So he drew out his sword. And Paul cried out, do thyself no harm, for we, we are all here, in verse 28. And so this Philippian jailer, after all of this had come about, and saw that everybody was still there, and he was ready to kill himself, because he knew he was probably going to get killed if he, you know, if, if he didn't do it, the people in authority were going to do it if anybody had escaped on his watch. But he came trembling to Paul and Silas. You know, he had it. This is a literal come to Jesus moment for this Philippian jailer. And looked up with the most humble heart he could and asked Paul, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And this is the only time in the Bible that this question is asked. This is talking about salvation. Um, and answer in verse 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Um, so there is the gospel right there. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Uh, it's by faith. It's not a word. Paul didn't tell him to repent of all your sins and then turn to God. He didn't say that you have to believe, but then we need to get you baptized with water. To be saved, um, he simply said, said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it would be very easy, uh, if we're not careful, to spend our full hour on this verse here. Uh, but I don't want to have any time constraints because it's so important. So feel free if, if it does take that long, because I've got a lot of things I want to say about this. But uh, one thing that just dawned on me, uh, I really never thought much about this. I, I, I think I, I realized it in the past, but you know, more so today, because the last few days, you, you've been very busy making all these videos about the book of James and explaining that. And um, you've been making a point that I think is very well illustrated in this whole scene here. And, and, and that is, um, um, uh, 
how man views another man and what impact that has on them. Uh, how, in our sight, in man's sight, how do we judge another man? Uh, and James is talking about being justified. Uh, but I, I do think, I, I believe that there is such a thing as uh, lifestyle evangelism. Now, I know that there are some of my really closest friends here on YouTube that come out against things like lifestyle evangelism and 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 uh, what's it, another word, maybe friendship evangelism or something, another word for it, uh, rather than just telling them something, uh, but uh, telling them the gospel right off the bat, people observe a person's life. They observe something uh, in their life and, and it causes a question. Uh, that person sees something so different about an individual that it piques uh, their curiosity and they've got to know why is this person so uniquely different than everybody else? And, and, and I, I hope I don't have anybody offended that I'm going to point to myself just for a moment here. But in, in my life, uh, for before I got saved, it's, it's a miracle I'm not in prison or dead because most of my friends from my earlier life are, and they, some are still in prison. And, and, uh, and then, uh, but over the years, uh, my life has changed dramatically. Uh, now that doesn't, that's not necessarily proof that someone's saved. Some people can change and not be saved, and some people can be saved and, and never really change. But in my case, um, the Holy Spirit has been transforming me, and it's, it, he has changed my desires in my life and my behavior and my interests, like what we're doing right now, brother. That, you know, 40 years ago, uh, you think I would have any interest in spending time talking to somebody about the Bible? But no, I mean, it's the last thing on my mind. I wanted to get high or, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll and go rob somebody, you know? So, I, uh, so the, the point I'm making is that uh, I've had people who've known me for many years and they've seen my, the change in my life and they're astounded by it. And, uh, and the point I make to them is, uh, the, the, I say, it's, it's really not natural, is it, the, the dramatic change? It, I, I say the change is supernatural. And, and, and when I look, listen to this account of Paul and Silas, uh, their, their conduct, here they are in jail. They're chained. I'm sure they're very uncomfortable. It's not a pleasant place to be. I've heard a lot of accounts about what the jails were like and what their conditions were probably like for Paul and Silas. And I'm sure that it was very uncomfortable. And there was probably a real fear on their part that maybe they'll be killed. Maybe they'll never get out of prison, you know? Uh, so that was a possibility for them. Maybe even a probability. And yet, under those circumstances, what are they doing? They're singing hymns praising God. Now, that is uniquely different than uh, your typical prisoner. And uh, that when that jailer observed that, they were kind of justified in his sight, saying, man, there's something crazy going on here. People are not supposed to be so happy under these conditions. And then the other thing, I, I think you mentioned this, but I, I'm not sure... You, you, the point where uh, he, the jailer thought that everybody had gone and he was going to kill himself. And then Paul and Silas said, no, don't kill yourself. We're all still here. And the fact that they did not let him kill himself and then they could just free to, they were free to go if they, he killed himself. Instead of thinking their own, of their own freedom, they, they wanted his, him to spare his own life, even if they meant that they were going to have to stay in jail. That had to make an incredible impact on the jailer. So that probably just made him say, well, I, you know, I've been listening to you, your songs, your conversations, and the things you're doing here, and I have to know about this. You're talking about being saved. Well, what do I have to do to be saved then? Now, there's a lot more I want to say about all this, but rather than go on and on, I could just get your reaction to that. that people are doing these things that are pleasing to God and 
being a good witness, and we certainly should do that. But we can't just do that and then expect people to see our lives and understand the gospel. You also got to tell them the gospel. You can't just go around thinking that, you know, I'm leading this nice, holy life and people are seeing how happy I am. Because <laughs> that's not always the case. Mm-hmm. Um, and think that that's going to lead anybody to Christ because it's not. You have to be a good witness, but you have to tell them the gospel. You have to mm-hmm. tell them the good news. Mm-hmm. And and that's the only way that they receive it. Um, well, can, can I, uh, I, 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 normally I don't, I, I try not to interrupt at all, but I want to say something because I'm not sure you're going to go here, go with this. But I, I think it's important to add this to your, your point there. And then as you're saying to, to uh, live a really good life but not tell them the gospel uh, is, may not accomplish anything. Uh, if they don't have the gospel, your example doesn't do any good. Now, if we, on the converse, though, how about the person that tells them the gospel and then does the, exactly what you've been talking about in James, says, go find your own food. You're hungry, I know, but so what, you know? I just, I tell you how to be saved, believe on Jesus, now go find your own food. Uh, so that's, that's exactly. just as... That I, person isn't justified either, and that person's odd. Uh, it takes both, that's why it takes both faith and works. <laughs> that's the whole point of James too, to be justified in the eyes of men. Um, you know, if, if somebody is, um, Telling me the true gospel, we had talked before, say like me and you, and I know you know the true gospel and believe it. And then I fall on hard times and I need help and I reach out and I call you and you hang up on me, you have nothing to do with me, you don't help me at all, you show me no brotherly love, then I'm going to think, man, I know Brother Luke told me the true gospel. And said he believed it, but by his action, I don't know if he lied to me. And so, because of your lack of action towards me in a time of need, you are no longer being justified in my sight. Now, if you had truly put your, and you have put, truly put your faith in Jesus Christ, no matter what you did, how you reacted to my situation, you're saved eternally. But you're not being justified in my sight. On the flip side of that, if somebody comes to me and gives me those things that I need and is helping me, is showing me all this love and care, they're justified in my eyes. But then if we continue to talk and develop a relationship and start talking about the Bible and talking about faith in God and what they believe in, and then they say something to me like, oh, yeah, I go to church all the time. I go three times a week, and, you know, um, I believe in Jesus, but you just can't live any way you want to. And, you know, I think I showed, obviously, my faith by what I did for you and that I have obedience, saving faith. And, you know, if I didn't do that for you, I could lose my salvation. Now, suddenly, those good acts that they show me, they're no longer justified by their what they're telling me their faith is. And, you know, and I'm thinking, suddenly, these acts that I thought were out of brotherly love were really out of selfishness, because ultimately they think that their actions are affecting their right thing and with God. Instead of helping me out of unfeigned love, uh, having true brotherly love, so it takes both faith and works. That's what James 2 is talking about. Mm-hmm. In the sight of men, not the sight of God. Yeah. Now, um, you know, and, and most people who know me and my channel very well know that my take on James is different. But uh, the point you're making in your teaching on James and the point we're talking about right now, I think is a spiritual truth that uh, is, is very important for everybody to understand. Why in the world would the jailer even ask the question? He would not even dreamed up the question unless he observed a lot of things about these people that stimulated the question. Um, so that's that's important to understand. And uh, uh, now the the um, 
that brings me to the, when I first started preaching, it was, uh, let me see, around, uh, I think it was around April, um, March or April of uh, 05, is when I started doing my uh, street preaching. And I, I'm the type of person that, well, I thought I could just go out and fly by the seat of my pants. And, and I was, I was so bad that I was embarrassed and ashamed that, uh, that here I am trying to be an ambassador for Christ. And, and I, I didn't do a good job. And I, I knew that Jesus deserved my best. And, and so I made it a plan to really make a great sermon. So I wrote a, a sermon, an evangelism, evangelistic sermon that was really about 90 minutes long. And I wrote it and memorized it word for word. I didn't know I even had the mental capacity to do that, but I did that. And so when I went out, that's, that's what I started doing. But with experience, I learned that that was more information than, than they needed, that, that, that I should have been, I should have been just staying focused on a few basic principles. Uh, uh, I got carried carried away. I think trying to impress my audience with my knowledge. I think it was a little ego. I think, but the point I'm making here is the the theme the of the that first sermon I put together was it was titled Eternal Questions, and I wanted to answer the questions that every person asks in their life at some point, and uh, I started asking the questions. In December of 1986, uh, after my mother died, and the questions were, "What happens after we die? And what is the purpose of life? And is the Bible true? And who is Jesus Christ? And is there a heaven? And if so, what do I have to do to get there?" These are eternal questions, and it's interesting that these questions, um, and, you know, Jesus. Asked his apostles, he sent them out, and, and when they came back uh, from preaching, he says, who do they say that I am? That's one of the questions. Who is Jesus Christ? We, uh, I hope everybody can get that answer that one correctly. He's eternal God Almighty, manifest in the flesh as the Son of God, the Savior of mankind, the only Savior, the only source of eternal life. And he's not a creature. He does not have a beginning. He's not an angel. He's not a mere prophet. So... That who is Jesus Christ? He asked that question. So if Jesus asks the question, I'd say it must be pretty profound if, if, if uh, Jesus is saying, here's a question for you. And the other question, uh, of course, is asked right, right here. And that is, what must I do to be saved? Uh, there, there may be no more important question in the Bible, uh, and there may be uh, uh, no more in, uh, profound uh, in question. Um, and here we have an answer. Uh, another question that was asked of Jesus is, what works does God require of us? Uh, it's phrased a little bit differently. I think, uh, what are the works, uh, that, uh, the works of God, uh, that I forget how the Jewish, the Pharisee posed it to him, but he, Jesus said, this is the work of God, that ye believe in the one he has sent. So, the thing that's required of man is to believe on Jesus. That's what that's what Jesus said. Paul answers the question the same way. What must I do to be saved? He just says, believe on Jesus. So that's the answer. Believe on Jesus. Now, uh, before I go on, I, I like to you know if you have any thoughts on that, but I want to go into more about why uh, this. If you think, I hope I hope you agree with me that this answer is sufficient. But but. Before I go into that, uh, any, any thoughts or anything I just said? Uh, I'm, I'm in agreement. Okay. I've had some YouTubers uh, who are actually very, very knowledgeable. They're almost scholarly in their, in their, their Bible knowledge. And, and, and uh, um, some of them, I mean, I consider them true brothers, uh, but, but some of them have... Uh, come against me because uh, I teach that you can be saved by a single verse in the Bible. And, and you don't need a series of verses presenting uh, 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 and covering a, 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 a series of, of topics. Uh, that 
And, and they say, no, there, there's no such thing as single verse salvation. But I believe that in the book of John, you probably have a hundred examples of single verse salvation. You have this one here. You have the answer I gave you earlier. Jesus said, they asked him what works are required. He said, this is the work of God. Believe on the one he has sent. So there's a lot of verses where I believe it's, it's sufficient in one verse, even though he didn't give them a lot of information. Now you notice that there was a lot of information left off there. He, he, he didn't explain that Jesus is, uh, came down from heaven. He didn't explain that Jesus was eternal God and he didn't say that he became a man, the son of God. He didn't say that he died on the cross and paid for our sins. He didn't say that he rose from the dead. And he didn't say all these things that normally you and I want to make sure everybody understands because we don't want to be uh, negligent. We don't want to be lazy and, and not. And plus, we love to talk about Jesus and, and all of these things. It's, of course, we want to be thorough. Uh, but here, now I think when they went to Paul's man's house, I'm sure Paul and the others, they probably talk about all these things to, to, to the jailer and his whole family. But at this point, the answer was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, is that enough? Was that sufficient? Or could we say that Paul either was negligent by not telling him enough uh, or that Paul was misrepresenting it because more is required and Paul said that's all that's required. talked a lot uh, on our earlier videos about so many different things already but but we've I, I've tried to go into more detail and in, in about what it means to believe in Jesus and is that is that exactly the same thing uh, as an interchangeable term with believing on Jesus if, if if there's a distinction what what is the difference uh, and um, you know, it's sad to me. Uh, one of my playlists is uh, Words Defined. We were talking earlier about uh, it, it's a shame that uh, some of the 
the works heretics, um, and Calvinists too, they're very good at this too, but they, they take a word that uh, in their normal circumstances, no one would debate the meaning of the word. It's, it's an easy word. Children understand what certain words mean. And uh, it's not complicated. It, it's, it's not a mystery. And yet they tell you, no, it doesn't mean that at all. They, they redefine certain words in the Bible. Uh, and uh, so I and others, we've had to actually make a video, believe defined. I have to define what the word believe means. But here he's saying, it says, believe on the Lord Jesus. And the way I uh, interpret believing on is I, I think that um, be, the word on, it, it leads me to, to look at it as like depending on, relying upon. Uh, so he, and nowhere in the Bible is th this question asked so succinctly and explicitly as it is right here. What must I do to be saved? No, <laughs> that's not vague. That's as clear as can be. And the, the answer is short and sweet. Depend on Jesus. Rely on Jesus. Just trust Jesus and you're saved. And yet there's so many churches out there that will have what must I do to be saved on their literature or brochure or pamphlet for their church and then they start listing all these steps and all these works instead of just looking at the next verse to see what it says. You know, for I came out of the Church of Christ and they have a six step process that is impossible that nobody can do. Um, you know, to hear and believe amen and amen but you have to repent of all your sins now and confess and then be water baptized and then live faithful to the end. Who can do that? Nobody. Nobody's going to heaven if you have to do that. Um, but yet in their pride, they think they can. They think that they can do that. And, and that that's part of salvation. Well, they're not resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And when what must I do to be saved is quoted on that pamphlet with all those steps, they need to quit looking at that church's false gospel on their pamphlet and read the next verse in the Bible. Um, you know, and it, it's just when, when you, you know, like for instance, again, it's just back to my roots with Church of Christ, Acts 238 is their big salvation verse. They don't look at um, Acts 16, 30, and 31. Their big verse is Acts 238. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And they add of your sins to the word repent, first of all. Um, and then add the word water to the word baptized. So all of a sudden they've added words with the um, the word of God to say repent of your sins and be water baptized. Um, but Luke wrote the book of Acts, right? He wrote Acts 2 38, but he also wrote Acts 16 30 and 31. So is Luke telling, is Luke relating this story of Paul and Silas to the Philippian jailer saying one gospel, but then relating what Peter said at his Pentecostal sermon to the people of Jerusalem and specifically at that verse to the Jews, was he teaching them another gospel? No, it's the same. It's the same gospel. The Bible doesn't contradict. If it looks like it contradicts, then you're, you're not understanding it properly. And so I just want to make that point clear that, you know, some of these churches, they will copy and paste their own gospel. Uh, they'll make a false gospel and, and get all these different verses and uh, make a big PowerPoint and put it all in. It looks so nice and neat, but it's in contradiction to hundreds of clear verses that it's by faith alone, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Um, so when you see churches that are copying and pasting and making their own gospel by pulling all these verses out, just beware of that. that those are false gospels. If, if it's not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, 
much of how shall be saved, and that's it. And then you have to do something else as far as, um, you know, your self-efforts, your work, any type of just work or, um, you know, following the law, then it's a false gospel. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I think we've been pretty thorough, and some people might be surprised that uh, the final phrase is uh, something we also, I think, owe an explanation. It says, and thy house. Um, I don't know how many people um, don't understand uh, this in the context of the whole chapter, uh, but uh, uh, I actually had a young lady that came to my my home church, you know, I had a congregation in my house for seven years, and, and and this girl, it was just amazing to me because she had so many years of experience, and yet she she thought that when it says "end thy house," that meant that if she's married and has children, and her children don't believe, and her and her and, and her uh, husband doesn't believe, but she's a believer that his, her house was covered because of her believing. And it was because of this verse here. She took that to mean that, okay, if I believe, everybody in my house is going to be saved. Uh, so maybe you can uh, explain. Uh, I don't know if you've ever come across that. I don't think it's that common, but maybe some people think it and, and don't bring it up a lot. But uh, uh, and maybe some people just are confused about this and never really gave it a lot of thought. So please ex explain that to me. Yeah, when most people that are teaching this verse for salvation, they won't still say in the house that most will just say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Um, and don't finish the verse. But like you said, this verse isn't that if somebody in a household believes and everybody else is covered, um, you know, each individual soul has to come to that acknowledgement of the truth of Jesus Christ um, and receive through faith uh, the free gift of eternal life. Somebody else can't do it for you. Um, you know, this, this is just saying, you know, this isn't only for you, Philippian jailer. It's for everybody. Everybody in your household, everybody in your family can receive the gospel message too. They can receive salvation. Now they have to they have to hear it and believe it. But this isn't just for you, Philippian jailer. This is you you shall be saved and your house can be saved uh, by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And anybody else, uh, if you want to invite some friends over to your house and we give them the gospel and they believe it, they can be saved too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, could you imagine if? Uh... The, the jailer was told that, uh, yes, j jailer, uh, believe on Jesus and you will be saved, uh, but this doesn't apply to the rest of your family. You know, this is only for you. <laughs> you know, that would be pretty, I mean, would you call that good news? I think that'd be kind of tragic if you love your family. I mean, the first thing uh, I thought of, and I think the first thing a lot of people think of after they get saved is, what about my family and friends that I love? I want them to uh, hear this too and, and, and go to heaven and, and uh, so there's a, a great uh, desire to uh, share this good news and salvation so uh, in this case he's mentioning and thy house before the jailer even brought it up but Paul's kind of giving him assurance hey and also not only is this good news for you jailer but your whole household can benefit from this too so let's go there and tell them about that about this salvation, this free gift. But the Amplified, uh, you know, I like to look at that and probably most of the time it's, it's turning out to be pretty good help, but there's a few cases where it's uh, uh, not so good. Uh, it's even uh, heretical in uh, promoting a discipleship instead of salvation. Uh, but in this case, that final phrase, it says, you and your household if they also believe. So that's really the way to, to consider that last phrase. When it says, and thy house, 
it applies to them too if they will also believe. So let's go tell them now. And that's what they did. All right, well, we didn't take a whole hour to go through this verse. Uh, let me see, 35 minutes. But we were pretty thorough, I guess. I guess we could go longer if we wanted to, but I think it's, it's thorough enough. Uh, anything else before I go to the next one? No, we can move on. Okay, the next verse is Luke chapter 7, verse 49 and 50. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. All right, brother. Um, this is the story of the uh, woman washing his hair with her tears. Uh, the Pharisee was rebuking Jesus, saying that this woman's a sinner, and you knew who this person was that touched you, and, you know, and then basically um, Jesus speaks to, um, I think his name is Solomon, uh, speaks to him and, and gives him a parable, as Jesus often does. Um, and then uh, continues uh, to address the woman who is doing this, um, you know, servant-like, um, you know, basically bowing at his feet, um, showing um, her, you know, love and and respect and and all those things, um, and he said. Thou sins are forgiven um, in verse 48. And then it says, just like you said, then they said, and me with him began to say to themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. So it's not that she washed Jesus' feet, um, you know, in that work of servitude and washing the feet with her hair and tears, it wasn't her crying and feeling so bad that she was a sinner. None of those things saved her. Her faith saved her. Uh, and so that's the point uh, within this study of 101 verses. We have to pinpoint what what allowed her sins to be forgiven and it was faith in Jesus Christ. That's what she ultimately did. That's what she was led to Jesus Christ. She understood she was a sinner and needed a savior. Jesus is God. He saw her heart. He has the capability of forgiving her of all her sins because he's God. And he saw her faith. Um, we see this a lot in the Gospels of the faith that saved me, the faith that made me whole. Um, you know, we see that so many times. And um, it doesn't ever say you're, you're grieving that you're a sinner made you whole or that you felt really bad about things or that you turned from all your sins made you whole. Uh, that that you saw the law and thought that you could keep the law in its entirety and you're this pious, holy person now and that made thee whole. Uh, or your good deeds or efforts. Jesus never said that made you whole. It's thy faith. It's always thy faith made thee whole. Thy faith saved thee. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the... The whole chapter, you know, there's there's actually several different stories in this one chapter here, and uh, this might be a good time to mention that uh, uh, in the original uh, writings, uh, and for probably thousands and thousands of, of uh, copies of transcripts, uh, 
there were no chapter divisions and verse numbers. Um, I don't know. Maybe it'd be an interesting th th thing to look up uh, when when the chapter and verse uh, system uh, when the, when's the first example of that being used. I don't know. Um, if you know, maybe you can tell me. But uh, uh, the thing is, a lot of times people use a, a chapter uh, division as a point where they they think that the subject starts and ends and it's all contained within the chapter. But there's a lot of examples of a point being made and the same point continues on in the next chapter to get the, the conclusion of the thought. Um, but I, I'm, that's not the case here. There's, there's a, I'm just trying to say that there are, that's an important thing for people to understand that you can't necessarily go by chapter and verse to determine, you know, the, the, um, um, where the content of the subject begins and ends. Um, but in this case, uh, this is one of the subjects that's discussed in this uh, chapter is this particular woman and, and uh, the interaction with her. And of course, the, the, the big event is when he forgives her sins. That is a huge controversy. Because just like Jesus claiming to be the Son of God was considered by the Pharisees to be blasphemy and worthy of death, also claiming that or saying to someone, your sins are forgiven, that would be blasphemy unless you are God. So this is a claim of deity uh, when Jesus forgives her sins. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's blasphemy, he's saying that he's doing something that only God can do. So uh, that, and they're shocked by his forgiving sins. Um, but what I find interesting here is that uh, the woman does not give any kind of like a, a testimony or proclamation about what she believes about Jesus. Uh, the only thing that Jesus tells us about the woman is her love. It says in verse 47, um, wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. So all we know from this verse is he's saying her sins are forgiven on the grounds that she loved much. But in this case, I would I just have to assume that she she demonstrated her love. It's kind of like what we were talking about earlier about you know showing you showing what you believe by what you do. And in this case, she showed how much she loved Jesus. He he could see it. But we also know that Jesus has the ability to read minds. There's many examples of Jesus saying telling people what they were thinking. And in this case, I I believe that he he knew that her demonstration of this love for him, there was even more to it. She loved him in a way, a particular way that caused salvation. She loved him, as I think as you do, brother, and I do. I love him as my Savior God. And it's not in there, but I, I, I think that that was her, um, that was, that was her thoughts and her attitude that's, that's not written. Now I'm this, I'm guilty of eisegesis right now by inserting that, that thought into there because it's not recorded that way. But, uh, uh, but, okay, I've just said enough. There's a little, I want to talk about the end of the verse, uh, the end of the chapter here after you give me your thoughts on that.
in scripture by the law and the prophets and the Psalms. And and she believed it and, and trusted in him. And that's why um, all her sins were forgiven. Now he does say and they, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I thought you were finished. Go ahead, you finish your thought. Finish your thought, please. Okay, all right. Um, I, I made the point about him uh, referencing her love. But uh, there's a lot of people who are loving people. They, they love their family. They love friends. Some people even love mankind and are very loving. And some people love God, that even though they may not understand who God is and they don't understand Jesus and, and this gospel, but they they love. But, but love is not the means of salvation. Faith is the means of salvation. We're saved by grace through faith. So even though uh, she showed this love and Jesus cited her love, he, he says here that what really saved her was her faith, he says. And he said to the woman, thy faith hath saved thee. Now, did she verbalize her faith? No. Uh, she didn't. She didn't express it. Uh, if anybody, if anybody just observed the whole thing, uh, they wouldn't necessarily know that she had faith. But I know that she had faith because Jesus said she has faith. So he know he knew her thoughts and her mind and her and her uh, how she felt about him. And he says that she had faith. And of course, that's you know faith in him. So, uh, and that was demonstrated. It's like what we were talking about earlier, going back to your uh, popular subject now of James, is she was showing him her faith by her work that she did, uh, crying and loving him and washing his feet. And it was a demonstration of her love and Jesus' a demonstration of her faith. Interesting that uh, this uh, so much of what we're talking about today. Uh, I'm seeing this uh, going back to your James teaching. Isn't it funny? Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's, shall we go on to the next verse? Yeah. Okay. The next one is Ephesians chapter one verse seven. And it says, "In whom we have redemption through His blood." the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Believe it. 
and being filled with that Holy Spirit of promise up to the day of redemption. Um, it starts with the praise of His glory in verse 12 and ends with the praise of His glory in verse 14. And right here, right before verse 7 and verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace, um, that we have redemption through His blood. Obviously, um, talking about Jesus, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace is all about what he did. It's him redeeming us. Uh, we're the purchased possession. Um, we don't purchase our salvation. We're, we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we become God's purchased possession. Um, that's why we can't lose eternal life. Besides the dozens and dozens of verses in the Bible that teach that, um, beginning with just what does the word eternal or everlasting mean. Um, but the purchased possession, you know, that we are through the redemption, through the blood of Jesus Christ, and then being forgiven of sins through the riches of his grace. The possession can't unpurchase itself. You know, we, we don't have that ability. It's not the will of a man or the will of flesh, but of God. That is how we are spiritually born. And once we're born, we're sealed until the day of re redemption. Um, we can't unpurchase ourselves. God purchased us for himself, not that we purchased eternal life by what we do is God purchased us for eternal life by what he did and we receive it through faith mm -hmm. yeah uh, this word redemption uh, I mean, there, there's a YouTuber that uh, the last uh, I guess few weeks or months maybe uh, he's been very busy. Sometimes he makes uh, a comment on our, our conversation videos. He'll make 10 or 15 comments. Uh, uh, and it's, a, it's a, a kind of a long string of comments and thoughts and a lot of questions. And numerous times he's uh, brought up the point uh, about redemption, justification, and salvation. And uh, implying insinuating that there is a uh, significant distinction between each of these words. And so uh, maybe if, if, if you could tell me if, if you think that a redemption, justification, and salvation, uh, uh, if there is a significant difference. I mean, I know that every word there's Different, unless they're, they're synonyms. I guess a true synonym means, the word means that they have exactly the same definition and the words are completely interchangeable. And, uh, but, uh, why not just use one word then instead of three different words? If, if, uh, if they all mean the same thing, why do we need three different words for it? Uh, so there, I, I believe that there probably are some subtle differences, but can we use redemption, salvation, and justification interchangeably, or is there some important distinction that we need to make clear as this uh, uh, this uh, brother uh, keeps him, uh, asking us? I think ultimately it's, it's different, different concepts, different words that have the same meaning, you know, uh, you know, to, to redeem something is to, to get possession of in exchange for payment. You know, um, Jesus redeemed us. Um, what he did on the cross, he paid for our sin. Uh, and we are his purchased possession because of his payment. Um, and so that the redemption that we receive. Um, through Christ, uh, justification, you know, like your, um, your way of thinking about that, being justified just as I have done that, um, you know, we're in right standing with God. It's not that our flesh is, is actively showing that we're justified and suddenly we're not sitting and doing all this 
you know, these things, that's a part of discipleship and maturing uh, and growing in God's grace. But um, we're declared just, you know, um, we, we're declared righteous. It's not that our flesh has become righteous. Uh, we're still in the sinful flesh, um, but positionally, we are declared righteous. That's how God sees us. Um, and the same thing with sanctification. Was that your, was that your next one, or was it something else? Well, redemption, um, there, if I have to I go mean, back... Salvation was your, yeah, yeah, salvation, you know, is very similar to, to redeem, to redeem and to save, uh, very similar. Um, you know, we are, um, we're being, our penalty's been paid, therefore, the wages of sin being dead, we're being saved from, we're being salvaged from that second death through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Um, so again, it, it all goes hand in hand. Um, and in this flesh, I mean, our fleshly body is, you know, we are not redeemed in this flesh. It's talking about the spiritual man. And God sees the end from the beginning. He sees us, he sees us as, you know, in right standing, a child of God um, who has no sin, even though we're still in this corruptible flesh right now. Uh, but through faith um, and receiving the free gift of eternal life, those promises that God has given those who believe in him are as good as done. So we will be ultimately sanctified. We will ultimately receive a incorruptible body um, and be redeemed uh, in that sense. Okay. Um, I I I'm going to try to uh, elaborate a little bit more on each of these words, but I do think that this particular brother uh, is his. A lot of his comments and questions I find very interesting, but sometimes, and if he's, I'm sure he's going to watch this, he watches all of our conversation videos, and I don't want to offend him. I appreciate him uh, commenting and asking questions. And uh, I, I'm, He's a true brother as far as I can see, and uh, from you know what he's expressed that he believes. Um, but I, I think he might be, suffering from what we would call being pedantic and, and uh, making too much of a big deal over, over uh, words like sometimes, uh, um, um, I forgot the word, it starts with S. Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. There's a word that I've used that a lot of people uh, have, that I think are hypercritical. Oh, semantics. Sometimes people, uh, they're really the only difference uh, really be between us is, is semantics, but our, our our conclusion is the same. It's just that we're our semantics are different in the way we express it. Uh, so I, I think that that's what the brother may be doing. Is he, he might be like being hypersensitive and, 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 and being pedantic and over semantics, <laughs> pedantic over semantics. Uh, okay, so let me. And I really actually like um, seeing some of his comments, even though I can't get to them all. You know, our shop is sharp and iron, and uh, even though sometimes, you know, we can sort of overanalyze things, uh, you know, occasionally I do that too. Um, you know, I think sometimes it can be detrimental in the long run if we keep looking at one little thing and, and can't let go of it or come to a conclusion. But to bring up some points to really help us understand true definitions and meanings and try to get some of the spiritual truths that we may uh, not be gleaning um, with a cursory, um, you know, um, reading of scripture or, or um, just briefly thinking about it, uh, I think is helpful. So, uh, yeah, I, I think there's, there's, uh, there's good benefits to, to, that and uh, but sometimes it can't. Sometimes you just can't get through all the questions, and uh, it, 
it's hard to do. Uh, but um, but yeah, I think I think um, I know who you're talking about, mm-hmm. and I, I think he's a, I think he's a good guy. Yeah. Okay, so let me attempt to uh, you know, kind of make some distinctions between these words here: redemption, justification, salvation. Uh, redemption. Uh, I think you explained it quite well. When I hear redemption, the kind of the picture that comes to my mind is uh, you uh, you have a hat and a coat, and you enter a uh, place where they say, "Let me take your hat and coat. Here's a ticket, and you can redeem it uh, when you leave." So they they set your hat and your coat aside in a space, and it's being held for you. But it's still yours, and you're going to use that ticket to redeem it later. So that's kind of like, uh, I think, what redemption is. God has us set, set apart, waiting for us to be glorified and and um, and uh, have eternal life in, in heaven. Um, the thing that all three of the words, um, really, that it is important to understand is that each one of them, your conclusion uh, is going to be the same. And that is, each one of them tells us that this word is telling us that you are guaranteed that you will be in heaven and have eternal life. Now, now the nuances or semantics and, and uh, of, of uh, how it's a word, how it's expressed, the finer points of the word, that's redemption. Now, justification uh, we talked about this, as I said, is a clever play on the word, just as if I'd never sinned. Just if a just, just if a just, just, how's the word is? Just, I can't even say the word now. Justification, yeah. Justification. <laughs> the way that people say to understand the word is justification means just as if I'd never sinned. In other words, God sees you as perfect and sinless. You're justified. Um, so, uh, but the end result is the same as redemption. When you're justified, you can rest assured you're guaranteed you're going to have eternal life in heaven. And the same thing with the, the word uh, uh, sal- salvation. Salvation means that you're guaranteed you're going to have eternal life in heaven. So they all have the same thing. However, salvation implies you said you, I've never heard the word salvage be related to it before that was I found that very interesting but but uh, salvation I think the root word is based on save or saved and so uh, saved uh, implies that there was a problem you need to be saved from uh, let's say that there's a man that's drowning and uh, uh, we need to save him, so we reach out to him, and he embraces and we pull him out of the water, and we're saved. He's saved from a horrible fate. He's saved from something bad. So the bad thing that is awaiting all of humanity is this: uh, uh, this they, there's a resurrection and a judgment, and that the judgment. Uh, you are either justified and saved, or you're you're lost. And if you're not justified and saved as a lost person that means that the your direction your your next stop is the lake of fire and the second death so that's something that if a person understands it and believes it that's something they don't want they dread it so they they want to be saved from that horrible fate so uh that's to me the distinction and being saved but the, the fact is if you're saved or you're justified or you're are, are redeemed, it's the same thing, and the end result is all the same. You're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven and have eternal life. Any, th- any thoughts? Okay. Any, any more thoughts on what I said or anything else about this verse? I didn't even talk about the verse. I just talked about those words. So we're kind of, I think, pressed for time unless we wanted to go on five minutes after. Um, I think you covered uh, your the whole verse pretty well in your your, your very first uh, uh, explanation, so I, no need to go further on that. I don't think. Uh, so unless there's anything else to be said about this, I think it's time for you to summarize the study. All right, uh, we saw three great passages tonight, and we spent half the time or so on uh, at fifteen thirty and thirty one. Only time. The question, what must I do to be saved, is asked in the Bible, and the 
answers believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be, be saved. And in my house, and that means that it's for everybody. It's not only for you, but it's for your family and friends or in the world. Um, and it takes faith, uh, as we saw in the second passage in Luke 7. Um, it's our faith that saves me. Uh, it's our faith that makes us whole. Uh, without Jesus, we're not whole. Um, and we need that. You know, a lot of people go their whole lives searching and trying to, um, you know, fill that hole, that, that something that they're missing, and they try to feed it with earthly pleasures and material things and, um, and even the false religions and, and things like that. Uh, but it's never going to be filled. That whole H-O-L-E, uh, and whole, you become whole, W-H-O-L-E, by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, and then, um, the last passage we just covered briefly, but we covered, um, Ephesians 1 before, and this is, um, you know, a, a, a continuing thought process um, on um, what must you do to be saved, and as you, we see the beginning of that in Ephesians 1, 6, and 7, and then really crescendo uh, verses 12 through 14. Um, so read that whole chapter to really get the, the context of uh, the verse we cover tonight. Hmm, okay. Um, well done. Uh, God, I, I just don't know. It seems like every conversation we have is like topping the previous one. I, not that necessarily it's better all the time, but I'm just so excited every time we we're having our conversation. Now I'm enjoying this so much. Um, but I, I think that we really were quite thorough uh, uh, in the subjects that were covered tonight, um, the things that we want the viewer to uh, know about and understand, there's a lot. We want you to know that you're a sinner and you're destined to uh, go into this lake of fire and the second death. That's that's bad. We, that's uh, every man's, every woman's uh, destiny, unless it's corrected, you, you get saved from that. And so, but we want you to know some facts, important things to know and understand about Jesus. Uh, we told you he's um, eternal, God Almighty. Uh, he became a man, uh, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, uh, and he, he did that so that he could die, and he did. He died on the cross, and in, in that death he paid for all of our sins, and he rose from the dead. And so these are the things we, we want you to know and understand. But there's one thing that you've got to do. And that was the answer to the question in Acts 16, verse 30. The question was, the most direct, important question ever, what must I do to be saved? Now, even though we've explained to you all those facts, a person can... They can understand and believe, yeah, I believe it's true. Jesus is the Son of God. I believe it's true he died for our sins. I believe it's true he was raised from the dead. But if you don't believe on Jesus for your salvation, acknowledging all those facts doesn't save you. Uh, and the example I give you to prove that point is there is uh, probably about uh, a billion Roman Catholics in the world. And you say, well, why are you picking on the Roman Catholics? Well, you ask any Roman Catholic this question. What do you have to do to be saved? <laughs> you know? Uh, ask them, are you going to go to heaven and why? If so, why? What, on what grounds should you go to heaven? When you ask a Roman Catholic that, every one of them says, I'm hoping to go to heaven because I'm good enough. They, they are, they are pleading their case for salvation entirely on their, uh, their own righteousness, uh, their own goodness. Uh, so even though you ask a Roman Catholic, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Oh yes, of course. Do you believe he died for our sins? Oh yes. Do you believe he was raised from the dead? Yes. Uh, do you believe you're going to go to heaven and why? 
well, I'm hoping I'm going to go to heaven if I'm good enough. <laughs> you know, see? So they never did the one thing that Paul says you must do. Believe on Jesus for your salvation. All right. So if you haven't done that, do it now. Rely on Jesus. Put all your faith entirely on him. Just like the woman that washed his feet with her tears, he said she was saved because of her faith. So you've got to have faith in him for your salvation. All right, I guess um, unless you have a lot of thought, any last thought before we close? That was great. All right, brother. Thank you for joining me again today. I look forward to next time. To the viewers, uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.